Hello everyone, welcome to the fifth episode of Anakazi Banking Online Conversations. I'm your host today. My name is Dean Nathaniel Onyambu. I trade foreign exchange and interest rates within the bank, within the Global Markets Unit. Our topic for today is the Global and Zambian Economic and Financial Market Update. And I'm joined by our very illustrious National Secretary for the Economics Association of Zambia. He also carries the hat of our Head of Operational Risk within the bank, Mutisungi Zulu. Welcome to the show. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome, Mutisunge. Thank you, Dean. It's been a very interesting uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we've seen a lot of uh, challenges within the global economy as well as the Zambian economy. Mm -hmm. uh, take us through what you have seen this year. Thanks, Dean. So, from a global perspective, it's been evolution of risk from uh, financial to non-financial. And never did we ever think that disease pandemic would uh, you know, infect the markets and be at par with the 2008 financial crisis. Um, if you look at quarter four, I'll take you to quarter four of 2019, you'll see that the risk ranking, uh, we were more worried about Brexit, we were more worried about the US-China trade impasse on a global level and geopolitical tension that was manifesting in the commodities markets. But then come first quarter of 2020, disease pandemic just went to number one. So there was that feeling where risks had subsided, but then come first quarter of 2020, disease pandemic, and that just then crippled financial markets. Started in China, and if you look at the base metal markets, commodity markets, currency markets, and this has just infected the entire world. In fact, asset valuation has been a source of concern, and uh, it beats the 2008 financial crisis, which is worrisome. It has shaped the way central banks are thinking. There's been enough stimulus coming from the monetary side and from the fiscals. And maybe just to delve into what we've seen in the base metal markets, I think copper, which is very dear to the world, which is a bellwether for economic pulse, actually gave up a lot of those gains, having opened at $6,300 a metric ton and did slump to 4,334 and uh, that's around March period and has pretty much recovered. If you look at the um, crude markets, I think crude oil did even uh, shrivel into the negatives. I mean, there's never been a history of uh, commod I mean, crude um, markets that uh, oil has gone into the negatives because of supply concerns, demand, aggregate demand and growth focus. So the world is set to recede right about minus five 0.1%, which was a revision by the World Bank coming from a level of um, minus 3.5 earlier at the virtual uh, spring meetings in April. You're much more closer to the FX markets globally. Uh, maybe you could want to share some light on what you're seeing and how it's been so far. Um, I think it's very interesting. I, I, I sort of caught on to what you were talking about with regards to asset valuation. Mm. I think if you look at the equity markets at the moment, there's a feeling that they're a bit overstretched, particularly if you're looking at the US mm -hmm. and some of the other more advanced economies. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a sentiment within the market that what's happening within the equity markets is not mirroring what's happening within the real economy. The disconnect. There's a disconnect there. And if you look at the underlying risks at the moment, mm -hmm. If you look at the geopolitical tensions, for example, you look at um, just yesterday, you had 20 Indian soldiers killed uh, in the Himalayas by Chinese troops. So you've got Indian-Chinese border tensions. You've got Hong Kong flaring up again. Uh, that's going to be an issue between the Chinese and the US and the UK. You also have the uh, trouble, uh, trouble in the Korean Peninsula with regards to the North Korea bombing the, um, the uh, liaison office with their South Korean counterparts as well as the, the fact that you've got that civil unrest in the US. And I think a lot of people have sort of forgotten that we had that US-China trade war and it's not gone anywhere. And there might actually be that underlying risk that we might see some tariffs being reimposed there. Yes. And then if you look at what's going to come in the second half of the year, 
a lot of businesses which had been shut down for two to three months, I don't think you can expect some of those businesses to survive. So I think there might be a um, coming, coming flurry of bankruptcies in the second half of the year. Um, there's a recurring second wave of uh, coronavirus. We've seen in China, for example, Beijing, they've had to close schools. They've had to do partial lock lockdowns. In the U.S. as well, I think five states had their largest uh, ever spikes in coronavirus cases. Uh, one of them is Florida. Um, if you look at, uh, we also have the U.S. election, that's going to be key, particularly if it becomes a case of if the, the White House and the chambers of Congress are moving from the Republicans, um, the Republicans currently control the Senate and the White House, but if all those shift towards the Democrats, I think you might see um, an increased uh, tax regime coming through there, which might impact businesses going forward. And I think also because you've got this coronavirus at the time when you might be going into the U.S. election, I think something that we should watch out is potential litigation issues with regards to mail-in voting coming through in the U.S. But when you consider all these factors, I think it, it really does cement the fact that despite the fact that we're seeing some silver linings in economic data, do think that um, this economy, uh, particularly equity markets, look ever overvalued. Um, this economy does look like we're not really going to see that V-shaped recovery that a lot of people think is going to happen, particularly the equity markets. It's more likely going to be something of a W-shaped recovery or even that square root recovery we were speaking about um, off the show. So for me, I think what you're seeing now, particularly if you look at the, the direction of the dollar, if you look at safe haven currencies like the, um, the Swiss franc as well as dollar yen, they've actually been moving sideways while you've had risk assets like uh, some of the commodities and some of the equities rallying. And for me, what that suggests is what you're seeing is actually a, a risk of rally rather than a turn. Um, so what that means is that going forward, we should expect to see some downside, particularly, I think, in the equity markets. Um, I think at the moment they're being really supported by the amount of uh, money we've, we've seen being injected by central banks, particularly the Fed, uh, whose balance sheet has actually almost doubled since uh, from March to June. Um, but I think what our viewers would really like to know is, what is, um, what is happening on the global picture? How does it relate to us within Zambia? Okay, so I, I, look, I, I guess this disease pandemic is, is, is global. So we're not immune from it as well, because um, if you look at the pattern of coronavirus infections, it was more like how the world is networked. Yeah. You know, the international routes, because of flights, people have moved the virus from one point to the other. And as Africa, for instance, uh, we are not spared from the same. Economies have locked down and slowly coming down to Zambia as well. Our neighbors have been on lockdown. Our trade partners are in total lockdown. If you look at the likes of South Africa, they're running a lockdown as well. And uh, the trade relationship between us and South Africa, 30% of our import bill is with South African yeah. products and that then impacts the flow of goods, uh, importation of fuel, for example. We always think that fuel comes through um, Nakonde, which is the, the Dalasaram route, but then uh, there are um, routes from Durban as well, the tankers uh, as well. So our copper as well does get exported through that corridor. So because of those infections, and if you look at some of the infection rates, they were actually coming in through truck drivers that are ferrying commodities. So to some extent, you see our airports have been locked down. So that partial lockdown has actually impacted supply chain distribution. And if you look at the supply chain distribution, pretty much manifests in private sector pulse, which is now yeah. your purchasing managers index. If you look at our index, it's the lowest ever since that index started being yes. tracked. And 34.3 is really, really low. And compared to our peers as well, all our peers are in negative territory. And maybe one thing I just want to bring out is that um, most African jurisdictions are going through similar pain. It's as though we could even predict what the outcome of monetary stimulus would be and any fiscal um, intervention. But what is very categorical is that fiscal issues were there even before COVID and COVID yes. has only amplified those fiscal issues. And maybe a question for you would be, talking about these fiscal challenges. Before I get to the question, we'll talk about these fiscal issues. And then we also are coming from an energy poverty era yeah. where energy was an issue because of climate change resilience issues and it didn't rain that much and over dependence on hydro. Um, and on top of that, 
um, hydro in itself, uh, energy, uh, if we look at fuel as well, Zambia had like, uh, was it three incre increments like last year, and uh, we've not had an adjustment to get any yeah. reprieve despite the kwacha uh, price of oil being right about 40 to 42% lower, which we believe the Energy Regulation Board would have taken advantage of to then pass on benefits to manufacturing. So um, we are pretty much in a tight spot and you could see that finance ministers across Africa through the African Union are now pushing for debt moratoriums, debt write-offs and just to get that reprieve because currencies for example have uh, depreciated and with a depreciated currency used to calculate debt to GDP, debt to GDPs are then through the roof for most African nations including Zambia and that's why this, this drive for, for debt um, cancellation is on to have a little bit of breathing space so that funds can then be channeled towards uh, other sectors that will then cloud back some of that growth that has been eroded. But you being an FX and I are interest rate trader, how are you seeing this manifest in your curves in the interest rates that you are trading and in, in the exchange rate? Uh, it's a very loaded question. Um, I think just where we need to start from, I think, is something that you really touched on. The fiscal issues that we had predated COVID. Um, and it's pretty much the same in the private sector. You mentioned the PMI was at 34.3. It's actually been in contraction over the last 15 months. So the private sector has been contracting for the last 15 months, which means that that PMI has been below 50. The last 21 out of 22 months have also been in contraction. And if you look at um, the PMI, actually since the start of that data being collected mm. in around March of 2015, mm. two thirds of the time, it's actually been in contraction. It's actually averaged around 48.4 from March 2015. And the big reason for that is, as you've mentioned, it's really about our fiscal structure. Mm. And that has played a part in impacting the private sector. We've seen um, an increase in government borrowing and government spending on the back of that. But there is a case that can be made that obviously that has impacted the private sector, particularly on the, in the interest rate space. And that's what we saw pre-COVID. You had the elevation of interest rates. We had record highs at the beginning of this year. If you look at the, the one year, record highs, I mean record highs, uh, if you look at the last decade, for example. You had the one year going to north of the, around 30%. Yeah. You've got your bond yields already above 30%. Mm. We didn't have as much divestment with regards to offshore players this year. And I think that was a saving grace for us. Mm. A reason for that is I think a lot of offshore players had already exited or hedged their positions with regards to what they held in government securities or with regards to uh, a dollar quacha. Mm -hmm. But the pressure that we really saw this year was actually also before COVID. Exactly. So we had the problem of the fact that you had a lot of the agricultural demand for fertilizer and seed was concentrated between one period. And that's what pretty much led into that spike towards 19. We've since pulled back, not because the fiscal structures have improved, but because importation mm -hmm. has come off. I speak about importation because private sector is not doing as well. As an importing currency, we import um, a majority of what we consume locally. But because business is not doing well, you've seen a reduction in importation. And that has really been the significant factor as to why we've seen a pullback in dollar quacha with regards to less demand coming out of the uh, private sector as well as the fact that agricultural demand has gone out of the market for now, but it should resume at some point September into November. Okay, Dean, just on that point, sorry to cut you short, but I'm no, very sure. tempted to ask you a question that is FX related. So um, there's so much demand for foreign currency, which is dollars. And talking about agricultural demand, which I link to FISP, which is your farmer input support program, that gobbles quite a mat, uh, an amount of dollars, but at the same time you also have energy because remember we are net importers and we're importing crude. So these two are the biggest drivers and then we also have debt service. Yep. But then, was it a week and a half ago, we saw a directive by the Revenue Authority to dollarize mining taxes. So meaning the mines are gonna pay taxes directly and it will be in dollars 
over and above mineral royalty taxes because mineral yeah. royalty taxes were being paid directly as the central bank was trying to show FX reserves which have uh, fallen to right about one, just under one and a half years, which is 1.5, 1.4 billion. So what is your view on what the exchange rate would be with this new measure? Um, I was actually getting there. Oh. <laughs> uh, part of, it's part of the same narrative as I was building up to um, early on. If you look at the pattern of um, the purchases for dollars last year. Mm -hmm. So last year, if you look at the um, central bank purchases on the market, trying to replenish those reserves, mm -hmm. as we all know, are being impacted by the external debt service obligations. Mm -hmm. Those external debt service obligations are around 1.5 billion this year. Mm -hmm. But we haven't seen a significant uh, dollar purchases from the central bank. But like I mentioned, if you look at the pattern last year, mm -hmm. out of uh, a net $548 million, $430 million of that was actually purchased between June and October. Mm -hmm. So it does suggest that we could actually see that being ramped up in this period between June and October. Mm -hmm. And I think we have seen the central bank in the market at some moments trying to buy dollars, trying to boost those reserves. Mm -hmm. The thing about energy is going to be a concern going forward. I think it's, it's, it's very important that you've touched on the dollarization of the mining taxes mm -hmm. because if you have the mines paying some of those taxes in dollars, it does take away some of those important conversions that we see, particularly during the middle of the month for pay as you earn on water view. Which provides support to the quacha. Which provides support to the quacha. Mm -hmm. So taking, dollarizing those mining taxes mm -hmm. does theoretically take out a lot of dollars from the market. Okay. What you'd hope on the back of that is possibly some of that energy demand could also be diverted towards the central bank. Okay. And maybe even that agricultural demand towards the end of the year could be diverted to the central bank so that the market doesn't find itself at some moments where it's completely deprived of dollars to actually satisfy customer needs. So would it be right to say that because of dollarization, there is a chance that the FX market could shrink in size? I think that's, that's obvious because you've taken out the conversions. Yes. The shrinkage is going to happen. If they also take out the, the, or they divert the energy and the agricultural conversions, market shrinks even further. But I, I think, for me, my concern is that I think we need to see the central bank at some point when the market doesn't have the dollars, mm. at least trying to supply to try and diffuse some of that upside pressure that comes when the market is dominated by uh, dollar demand, and particularly dollar demand coming out from the energy okay. sector. But in terms of a range, at the moment though, I'd say that we're looking at a range of around 17.8 on the lower side mm. to 18.4 on the top side. But what our, our uh, clients should continue expecting is that dollar quacha trading is going to be very, very volatile. If you actually look at the last three months, the annualized volatility has mm -hmm. been around 18%. And if you compare that to the last five to 10 years, where it's been 14 to 17 percent, you can see that we're trading at the upper end of that volatility uh, yeah. surface. Mm -hmm. And then also, I think an important one also to discuss with regards to currency is going to be Rand Quacha. Mm. If you look at Rand Quacha, we've moved from 0 0.95 to 1.05, mm. and we're now in an upward uh, trending. We're in an upward trading channel, which has actually prevailed from somewhere around quarter two to quarter three of 2018. Yes. At that point in September, the uh, rand quarter was around 0 0.667. Mm -hmm. But we've been, we've been moving higher and it does look like it's going to widen. Particularly if we do see that the global economic uh, climate continues to be somewhat of uh, risk on, mm -hmm. I think South Africa is going to be a better beneficiary of portfolio flows than Zambia. Uh, based on the fact that um, their structure is a little bit more preferred on the, um, from the offshore perspective. Is that the reason why um, when the lockdown was eased in South Africa, flow started going in as though South Africa was not even downgraded into junk status. But then I think the RAND had actually hit 16.93. It started to push up again. So does that spell any concern that we should be worried about from the trade relationship we have? Are I we going to be importing yeah. inflation from I South think, Africa? I think that's already happening. Mm. If you look at the one year, the one year difference between where Rand Quacha is now and where it was a year ago, it's around 21% higher. Mm -hmm. On the dollar Quacha side already, that's around 39% higher. Mm -hmm. So despite the fact that if you look on a month on month basis, food inflation, non-food inflation, sort of food inflation was lower, non-food inflation has sort of stalled. I think the exchange rate effect is going to continue playing a part with regards to inflation, with regards to inflation on a year-on-year -year basis. Okay. So, Dean, if I look at inflation, um, 
inflation is linked to interest rates. When inflation is ticking upwards, then uh, in terms of premiums above taking risk in government securities becomes a source of concern. But then we are in a growth um, suppressed environment. Yep. Um, you talk about currency volatility, which I do pretty much understand. And will I be correct to say uh, we should not be worried about food inflation because if we look at what agriculture forecasts uh, would be for 2020, already we forecast that we'll have a bumper harvest, 3.4 million metric tons and the other uh, crops, crop yields will still be in excess of what the estimates are. So I would like to get your views on what the forecast is for inflation. And then secondly, uh, I'm looking at other sectors. So agric is doing fine, but then mining is our mainstay. But then if I look at um, energy supply, stability of energy, uh, with regards to the mines as well, I get a little concerned because production seems to be going down a little bit yes. uh, because of uh, disease pandemic uh, effects, uh, the mines have had to decongest. And so production is not uh, uh, as much as it should be. And at the same time, there are all bodies that are running out of copper, the likes of Luansha and all that. So I talk about that because I'm concerned about um, what will be collected in taxes because I know that the Zambian FX market, the biggest players are uh, the mines. So I would like to get your views on, um, on, on that affecting interest rate risks in totality. I think it's, you note very well that uh, food inflation may not be a problem, but non-food inflation may be a problem. Mm. Uh, when you look at it from an FX perspective, as we mentioned, taking out uh, those conversions from the market, the market could find itself a little bit vulnerable with regards to dollar demand, particularly coming from the energy sector. So there are chances that you could find moments where you see that spike in dollar quarter. And as we also alluded to earlier, there are some sort of um, underlying flaws there that might limit a significant uh, appreciation of the kwacha. As I, as, I, as I look at kwacha, actually, I like to look at this proxy analysis for kwacha. I like to compare it with, with assets where we are related to or we have some correlation and, and some asset classes which actually uh, have an impact. I was looking at copper. Mm. I was looking at the dollar index against major currencies. I was looking at uh, the dollar against uh, emerging markets. And if you look at that, over the evolution of those asset classes over the last one year, mm. and you look at what Kwacha has done over the last one year, if Kwacha had actually followed the same trajectory, we should have been trading somewhere between 14.6 and 15.8. If I look at the RAND, for the start of this year, we were pretty correlated to the RAND. Mm. I think from around January to around uh, the beginning of May, mm. Kwacha and the RAND were moving in the same direction. But then now you've seen a risk on rally. And Kwacha is lagging, not just the RAND, but its other peers. But if you look at what the RAND did over the last year, we should be trading at around 17.2. So if I look at dollar Kwacha, even from a technical basis, it does look like we should be trading in a downward trending channel. But as I've mentioned, it does look like there's a significant flaw there with regards to may see a pickup in dollar purchases from the central bank, mirroring the pattern that was there in 2019, mm. as well as the fact that you've seen this dollarization of mining taxes. Mm -hmm. And the impact on inflation, I think especially from the RAND perspective, mm -hmm. I think that's where that non-food inflation element might mean that we might not see, even if base effects come into, uh, come into play, we might not see inflation falling off significantly, might still be around 16 to 18% as we go over the next three to six months, maybe falling off towards the end of the year. In fact, if you look at the central bank monetary policy, they only expect it to come back to around 8% at some point in uh, 2022, if I'm correct. Yes, they gave it a two-year focus. They gave it a two-year focus. Mm. So inflation could continue being a problem. And I think for the consumer, mm -hmm. you've got inflation eating into your disposable income. And if you connect that to your business pulse and your private sector activity, I think it's going to mirror what you're seeing in a lot of jurisdictions where yes. I don't think you're going to see a strong rebound in consumer spending, mostly because the consumer is going to focus on priority goods and they're going to be very cautious with their spending. Okay, and just on that point, Dean, where we talk about inflation, because most central bank models yes. um, will then be thinking about tightening monetary policy when inflation is ticking upwards, but disease pandemic and public health has changed that whole analogy where it's now become uh, making a decision for a social cause yes. and ensuring that there is growth back to claw back the eroded growth from these economies. I mean, if you look at four countries, there's Ghana, uh, Kenya, 
Nigeria as well, if you look at their rate decisions and the monetary policy stance that they've taken, you'd see that most of them have eased monetary policy, even in times when inflation yes. was actually ticking upwards. So those correlations that we knew pre-COVID exactly. are now dislocated. I mean, just like we were talking about the deviation between what's happening in the equities market yes. and some of that stimulus that is taken. I mean, in times when uh, COVID cases are actually going up, you see markets rallying where markets are ignoring yes. as though COVID was not there. But we've seen a drastic shift over the last few days and yes. it's it's very confusing. Looks like a great time to actually do research around this. And yeah. no, I think it's an interesting time to be in mm. financial markets. I'll, I'll even I'll even go a step further. Modern monetary theory mm -hmm. was not considered to be mainstream. Yes. It was considered to be some radical idea. Mm -hmm. But if you consider what the Fed did, mm -hmm. paying um, money directly into households, mm -hmm. that's pretty much a function of modern monetary theory. Was that quantitative easing? I think it was further than quantitative easing. We've moved into uh, wacky theory or helicopter money. Yes. Uh, this modern monetary theory of mm -hmm. where you've actually got the Federal Reserve paying people paychecks and trying to bypass the financial system with regards to actually getting money to the consumer to spend. Yes. And then also using uh, using um, some of those measures, also targeting employment. I think these are these are major, major parts of what modern monetary theory, which was considered very radical just a year ago, yes. they're actually playing out in front, right in front of our eyes. Mm -hmm. And then also if you look at uh, towards the end of, uh, I think the middle of last year, there was mm -hmm. a very interesting article on Bloomberg with regards to targeting nominal growth rather than targeting inflation. inflation. Because when when you've got low growth, mm -hmm. even though you've got high inflation, what when you actually end up increasing interest rates, what you do is you impact growth even further by reducing it. So they were saying that what you should actually be targeting is your nominal growth. Mm -hmm. Because the high inflation, what is actually offsetting is the low growth. Yes. And I think that's, that's the world that we're living in. But I'd like to... I'd like you to, to, to at least lead us into a conversation on what the central bank has done. You already mentioned that um, some of our peers across the African region, yes. they adjusted their rates lower. Mm -hmm. We saw a significant move lower with regards to our monetary policy rate. I think um, we went from 11.5 uh, to 9.25, yes. 225 basis points lower. Yes. All right. So thanks for that question, Dean. So what the central bank did was that monetary stimulus, which um, it's the analog is interesting where it's a public health issue that is being sorted by by the central bank. It's as though the central bank has, you know, uh, are acting like doctors. It's a health issue, yeah, health issue by, by throwing, money, by throwing at money at it. Exactly. So the central bank, that's the Bank of Zambia, did cut rates 225 basis points. Um, it was very predictable. I mean, 9.25 percent. Okay. That was the first ever BPR uh, benchmark interest rate, and um, they had that room. And of course, it was against that uh, dichotomy of inflation ticking upwards, and no one would ever think that they would ease that um, monetary policy. So, a number of measures put in place. The famous 10 billion stimulus package, yes. of which uptake has not been that it's not much. Been I mean, it's about like 30 percent, 3 billion. Yeah. Um, has been taken up and look, it's like a credit card. You only use a credit card in emergency situations. So that in itself, when it was announced, the first thing that crossed my mind was, okay, this is additional liquidity, into, yes. which is pretty much expected yes. in COVID uh, credit risk environment. Yeah. But then you have that liquidity, but then excess liquidity is inflationary. And before announcing of some of those measures like dollarization of mining taxes, that would have been, um, been against the currency it would not support appreciation of the currency and giving people liquidity would have meant a boost in growth because there will be more imports people will have more cash and then that other part of inflation which is your uh, demand pool inflation where the you know old definition of too much money chasing few goods would then uh, kick in and then they've also relaxed some of uh, provisioning requirements and um capital requirements as well, yeah. uh, boosting digitization and uh, uh, constant presence in open market operations to ensure that liquidity conditions will then lead to financial um, uh, stability. So yeah. I bet the low uptake has also contributed to the inertia for the yield curve to climb down because we were expecting that the yield curve would then climb down 
and then looking at yeah. the price which was 100 basis points above yeah. your benchmark interest rate that would then start to reduce the cost of funding but that is not coming through as fast as it should be it should and i'm be. pretty much thinking that's the reason why they said let's just slash rates by 225 basis points more like to give yeah. it a um a, a jump start but then when you look at the monetary side you also look at the fiscal side but on the fiscal yes. side it's very clear that there isn't that much space and that's why even the tax cuts that were there yeah. were only on medical issues importing medical goods like ventilators yeah. and everything and at the same time maybe um, um tax cuts on importation of ethanol yeah. which is used to make uh, your your hand sanitizers in fact if you mm. look at the fiscal space yes. I, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned there's not a lot of uh, space there mm -hmm. if you look at the fiscal if you look at the first quarter, actually, if you look at the Ministry of Finance monthly economic indicators, spending was actually down 34%. Yes. So that tells you that they're already falling short with regards to what they targeted to spend for this year. And it also corresponds to the, to the reason why you're seeing a lot of uh, aggression with regards to trying to pick up a lot of monies from the domestic market yes. in the issuance of T-bills and, and, mm -hmm. and, and bonds. It's also why you've seen an uptick in private placements. That was mentioned by the central bank as well. At their monetary policy you've seen mm -hmm. a pickup in private placements so yes. this is issuance of bonds off tender so not in the primary auction window but the key gist here is that the government because there's not a lot of space fiscally but they do need to spend on the social safety net for example they they need to back it up with either raising money externally mm -hmm. which hasn't really been um successful this year i know we've we've spoken we'll speak later about uh, possible debt moratoriums or debt suspensions but the the real gist is that we haven't had um, a lot of um, success with regards to raising money externally. So a lot mm. of the financing has, has had to be raised domestically. Yes. And it's not just this year. That has been pretty much the theme in 20, 2017, 2018, 2019. And then this year has just been made worse because we're in an environment, that disease pandem pandemic environment that you mentioned. And when you actually relate that to the fact that, you, yes, you have seen liquidity pick up, You've seen that uh, 3.3 billion being dispersed for that medium-term refinancing facility from the central bank. Yes. But you've also seen the central bank injecting liquidity through the 90-day almost, almost at the T-bill rate, mm -hmm. pushing in, in in May that was around 1.7 billion. So far this month, it's a, in June, it's been around 330 million. Mm -hmm. That's really that avenue that has really boosted the liquidity. And the reason we should really be seeing an aggressive move lower in that 9-month and 12-month rates, as you mentioned. Yes. And that three month heading lower because that three month has been low for too long but you're not seeing that pace follow through and the reason for that is that you have that significant need for the government to actually borrow and that has been translated to borrowing on the domestic market yes okay so thanks th so thanks for that dean and um i see there's a risk skew towards shorter dated yes. higher yielding assets than fixed income and bonds so yes. it's as though it's very predictable that bond auctions will be deeply undersubscribed yes but t-bill auctions will be fully taken up yes so um maybe one other issue that we need to critically look at is debt restructure actually i can i can speak about the the longer end okay i, I think when you're looking at the investor at the moment mm. some of the investors are looking at next year's uh, august election so they yes. prefer to invest in the in the shorter end mm -hmm. but the other reason that you're seeing lackluster demand for bonds on the secondary market at least for the larger part of this year mm -hmm. has been the yields in the secondary market have been yes. lower have been higher than the yields on the primary primary market it's only now where the two years the three years five year bonds and the 15 year bonds where they're pretty flat with regards to secondary market levels and primary market levels but the yes. seven and ten year mm -hmm. bonds i don't think you'll see significant bidding interest there going forward because the primary market is just the difference between where the secondary market is and the primary market is is just too stark so investors would rather buy seven and ten year bonds on the secondary market rather than bidding in the primary auction but still on that point d could it be that appetite is being shaped by what the country's fiscal position is? Yes. Earlier this year, That's a very we had one. a spate of downgrades where sovereign risk is now a concern and they're pricing it into the markets. And I know the secondary market is actually much more liquid than the primary market. So we get an indication of what offshore investors are perceiving uh, the sovereign risks to be in Zambia, which still takes me back to debt restructure. Recently, um, yes. French asset management firm, investment banking firm, that's Lazard, was, was, was hired to, 
to reorganize so five million dollars. for five million dollars of course that's five is it five basis points compared to um the total debt stock for 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 zambia and you mentioned a very good pointer where there is political risks here and there next year is an election year and uh, um that's why people are um, investors are choosing to lock up their liquidity in shorter dated assets because it's very uncertain after 2021. Um, I would like to get what your views are in light of Lazard uh, reorganizing Zambia's debt, especially that this came out of, first of all, talks with the IMF and then the IMF asked Zambia to reorganize its debt. Is it a good or a bad thing? I think it's a fantastic thing. I think if you look at the success for Lazard mm. in countries like uh, Mozambique, yes. I believe uh, um, Ukraine, they're yes. doing Argentina now. And Greece. I think there's Greece as well. Yes. I think if you look at the track record for mm -hmm. Lazard, I think it's very positive that we got Lazard on board with regards to restructuring our debt. I think the key focus, particularly if you look at the unwillingness of some of these um, Eurobond holders, not just for Zambia Eurobonds, but yes. across, mm -hmm. There's a, a certain unwillingness with regards to, uh, to, to actually accept uh, restructuring some of these euro bonds. Some of them want to deal with countries on a bilateral basis. Yes. So for me, what I think the government is probably going to focus more on is trying to restructure some of that uh, uh, commercial debt, particularly some of that Chinese debt. And I think we're looking at a period of around six months. I think getting Lazard is going to be pretty, pretty helpful uh, moving in that direction. The only concern I have going forward, and I'd like you to comment on that, is if we do end up succeeding getting that uh, Chinese restructuring, maybe it takes six months, so we get some reprieve next yes. year mm -hmm. where external debt service obligations are lower. Does it reduce the need for an IMF program? Thank you, Dean. It doesn't reduce the need for an IMF program. It would be great to get a restructure in the next six months on the Chinese debt because, one, it gives a bit of reprieve because those resources that would be channeled towards servicing the Chinese debt could actually be channeled to service the $750 million. Yes. And then talking about Lazard, um, they, they are always sweeteners with these... Um, entities that are taken on to restructure debt because they have muscle to to underwrite debt which is where the misconception has been because a lot of individuals think yes they can restructure this debt even on a local basis I wouldn't want to belittle that uh, an average Zambian economist or a financial analyst would uh, you know restructure that debt but when you are settling for an asset management firm or an investment banking firm to restructure debt or to reorganize debt. You look at technical competence, which is yeah. track record, because you know debt restructure is a very complex process. Yes. It involves a lot of travel, engaging uh, private creditors, and there's legal fees and everything. And then 20% of it is usually financial muscle, the size of the yes. balance sheet, because the sweeteners are when you restructure debt, you sweeten it by saying, if I don't manage to do X, Y, and Z, I have the muscle to underwrite this debt, which is what is very silent and a lot of individuals do not understand. And I thought I should just make yes. that very clear. But if that happens in six months, trust me, that information, the more positive vibes we, we keep getting will price into the market exactly. and our debt internationally will be priced better than it is right now because our credit default spreads are pretty much wide. So... In a nutshell, there is a silver lining yes. and we remain bullish that come next year, we are confident that Lazard would restructure yes. or, or part of Zambia's debt and that would be a step in the positive. The good thing is taking that step to reorganize debt is a very good move. In fact, this, if this had been done three years earlier, I think right now it would have been a different story. Yes. I think it's, it's very important you mentioned technical competence. I yes. just wanted to add as well, uh, Lazard has the networks. It's got exactly. the relationships in True. place already True. to actually restructure the debt. And I think that's going to be a, a very big positive. So I like the fact that you've actually focused on that debt reorganization or debt restructuring because mm -hmm. the World Bank is ready to help. But they say we need the IMF to be on board. We need an IMF program. The IMF is ready to help, but they say we need debt restructuring. So everything is hindering on the successful reorganization of a part yes. or our entire debt. 
Okay. And just to mention one thing, Dean, is um, so should we successfully have our debt reorganized and we get into an IMF program? I know the figure that everybody links to IMF is like 1.3 billion. Yes. I don't know if it's increased or not, but 1.3 billion, just to be very clear, is not enough to solve Zambia's problems. But the benefits that come with being on a program yes. is increased flows. Yes. This country needs flows to flow through the veins exactly. of this economy. And it will also help with repricing of our debt on international capital markets, yes. which increases our chances of going to reissue debt if we were going to go for a euro bond to refinance yes. um, the existing uh, yeah. bonds because right now we can't even go into because international capital 40, markets because our 46 46 you can't exactly. find dollars at no, 46 percent you can that would be that's, that's detrimental exactly so i just thought i should mention that piece to say getting onto a program will really open yes. many doors because right now there are investors that sit on the fence but yes. they will have that level of confidence to then exactly. pour flows into zambia and i really appreciate that point because that's what happened in 2017 in zambia we had yields rallying, we had the FX, uh, we had uh, dollars coming into the FX market okay. because there was a premise of an IMF deal which never materialized. So if you look, particularly in the context of a world where you see uh, balance sheets, the Fed, Bank of China, People's Bank, uh, People, uh, sorry, People's Bank of China, Bank mm -hmm. of Japan, the balance sheets have, exp have expanded to greater than $23 trillion. There's a lot of liquidity out there that needs to find yield. If you look at our current yields, they're very, very attractive. But what's not very attractive is the fiscal position. So in a world where you see all this cheap liquidity based on this monetary stimulus that we've seen across the globe, yes. it's a world where portfolio investors are looking for yield. An IMF program would be a very, very attractive entry point for a lot of these portfolio investors. And then growth would get back and to levels of back. where we, the 7%. The Easy financing yes. of the budget because you've got money coming in. You've yes. got interest by offshore players in True. local debt. Mm -hmm. and some of, one of the reasons is that we haven't had significant offshore interest in local debt. Yes. Thank you, Mutisunge. Always a pleasure. It's been a very good discussion. Yeah. And I think a lot of people will find it very, very fruitful. Thank you for tuning in. We'll be back next week for the sixth episode of Anakazi Banking Online Conversations. Goodbye.